robots. The very word conjures up images of science fiction movies and visions of the future. But could the ancients have created automatic, programmable machines hundreds and even thousands of years ago? Full-size human replicants, animals that moved by themselves, sophisticated multi-action robotic chronometers over 50 feet high. Now, new evidence suggests that ancient androids may have been more reality than myth. The most imposing legacies of the ancient world still stand today. But temples, palaces, and tombs of stone do not tell the full story of life hundreds and thousands of years ago. If we look deeper beneath the ruins, we find a world of extraordinary automated machines. Although the ancients lacked electronics and computers, some of their automata were really surprisingly sophisticated and incorporated um, concepts like feedback control and programming. We are discovering that the ability to create programmable gadgets has been around for two millennia. There existed automated devices that were centuries ahead of their time. And many of the breakthrough innovations gave birth to the science of robotics and to the technologies we still use in automated machines today. A lot of people think that robotics was invented at the beginning of the 20th century, but there were proto-robots. There were a lot of proto-robots around throughout the centuries for 2,000 years, and without those, we wouldn't have any modern robots. The human imagination has always dreamed of a future where we might interact with life-size human replicants. But unbelievably, this might not be a dream. Could it have happened hundreds of years ago? Vinci is a small town nestled in the Italian hills. It might have remained an insignificant dot on the map were it not for one man, the town's most famous son, Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo was a genius in his own time. He created some of the most amazing inventions one man has ever produced and many of his concepts changed the world. The Leonardo Museum in Vinci contains models of some of the most important and fantastic inventions the world has ever seen. Ingenious counterweight cranes, Leonardo's prototype helicopter, the first in history, strange and claw-like wing designs for futuristic flying machines, and large tanks with heavy defenses and mounted with powerful cannons 400 years before they were first used in battle. But the museum contains treasures far more valuable than the models of his creations, the manuscripts that record the actual drawings and notes penned by the hand of Leonardo himself. The collection is known as the Codex Atlanticus, Contained within its pages are sketches and virtual blueprints for hundreds of Leonardo's inventions. Hidden among the pages of this text is an extraordinary find, one that challenges the history books. The pages describe in intriguing detail the inner workings of a fully automated android made to look like a knight. So now what it's left us with is having to be detectives. It's a bit like an archaeological dig. We have to go in, we have to look at the drawings over and over and over again. Florence, Italy is where Leonardo did much of his work. Alessandro Romanelli is a curator at the Leonardo Museum in the city. It is here that robotics historians have actually reconstructed Leonardo's robot knight, based on sketches made by Leonardo himself 500 years ago. Leonardo dedicated himself to the project of an automaton, which is a humanoid machine. Leonardo's android was designed based on an advanced knowledge of biomechanics. And that's the science of how our bodies move. And so he was all the time thinking about, how could I make a machine that would be like a person? Leonardo's robot was designed to replicate human movement through metal. Muscles, tendons, and ligaments were all first studied meticulously before their function was transformed into the robot's design. Leonardo thought of the human body as a wonderful, perfect machine, and he tried to create a mechanical model that could reproduce the effect of human movements. 
cogs in the chest of the robot were attached to axles that were wound with rope. As the key cogs rotated, the rope became unwound or wound tighter. The rope was attached to the limbs, and as the rope was pulled or released, the limb moved. It worked through the effect of tightening and loosening the ropes uh, to simulate the traction and straining of limbs. Beneath the knight's armor, we can see the gears and ropes that turned to tighten and loosen the ropes attached to the arms. We can see the wheels in the robot's chest. The ropes were fed from the cogs in the chest, through the shoulder and all the way down the arms. The result was that the turning of a gear produced a movement in the limb. This would be the movement of the arm. Put together, it produced a remarkably human result. So what the robot can do is hug someone. So they reckon it went up to people and hug them. The robot knight would have enthralled and entertained audiences wherever it went. But were there robots of the ancient world designed for more sinister and violent purposes? The ancient Greeks lived in an age of myth and legends, a world populated by gods and monsters. But in ancient texts, there are stories of another kind of being, this one fully mechanical, stories of robot warriors. Homer, the most famous of ancient poets and writer of the tale of Troy, tells us of the god Hephaestus, the Greek god of smelting and metalwork. He was the god of blacksmiths. He was the god of manufacturers. He was probably the first engineer ever on Earth. Ancient texts say that Hephaestus lived high in the mountains of ancient Greece. And it was here he had his forge, where he smelted, beat, and created weapons, armor, and all things metal for the gods themselves. He was said to have produced countless ingenious mechanical devices. But intriguingly, Homer tells us that he also forged robots. They are described as having three legs and could move and operate independently as if they were living beasts, truly ancient androids. Many of the historical references which we read now seem to be fantastical or even ridiculous in the claims. But one of the things that becomes more apparent the more one delves into it is that there may be well be a grain of truth in some of these claims. But is the idea of real working android soldiers in the ancient world as far-fetched as we might think? The Greek myths tell of ancient, supersized humanoid warriors. A good example here is the man robot android called Talos, who was made as a gift to the king of Crete. Legend has it that Zeus, the supreme deity and father of the gods, gave the robot giant to the king of Crete, an island off the coast of Greece. The elite warrior was charged with defending the island against all enemies. Talos was claimed to be able to move, he was claimed to be able to fight, and was given to help defend the place. Talos would run around the island three times a day and pelt invaders with large boulders. Was this the world's first robot warrior? If anything, it was robotic in shape, but probably consisted of a person in a suit. Whether the Talos existed or not, it is evidence of a fascinating discovery. Even if the ancient Greeks did not yet have the technological capability to build human replicants, they had taken a massive conceptual step. They strived to create machines that behave like humans. They understood that with the right technology, human robots could one day be constructed. Most of the cultures in the ancient world had mythological references to robotic machines or robotic people. There seems to be a sort of human obsession with machines that mimic the human form or animal form. They certainly were starting to put together the ground rules of robotic machines. They understood levers, pulleys. Most of the mechanical principles that we know of today were invented in those times. The ancients clearly understood the concept of robotics, but were they able to put theoretical principles into practice? Remarkably, it would be left to one man to fully automate the ancient world. In his lifetime, the ancients would develop automatic doors 
drink dispensers, and even the same principles that drive today's motors and machines. Although we may think of robots and androids as being an invention of the 20th century, there is incredible evidence of early automated devices in antiquity. At the height of his power, Alexander the Great's empire covered much of the known world. And perhaps the jewel in the crown of his dominion was the city which still bears his name, Alexandria. Robotics seems to have begun in ancient Alexandria around about 300 BC. In 300 BC, Alexandria was the most vibrant intellectual city in the known world. This occurred basically because Alexandria was set up as a city where learning was very important. And leading the field was an inventor who can claim to be called the godfather of robotics, Heron of Alexandria. He's the big name, and it's for one simple reason. Five of his books are still in existence. Heron's books are evidence of an Alexandrian society that was so advanced, they became the center of learning and technological achievement throughout the known world. Some of these early peoples were far more sophisticated than we give them credit for. They were at least as intelligent as we are now. Their mastery of philosophy, of astronomy, of what we would now call physics, was absolutely immense. So it would be dangerous for us to underestimate their capacity. But is there evidence that the ancients actually devised fully automated devices? The answer is yes. Recently, new discoveries dating back thousands of years now tell us that the ancients did, in fact, have and use advanced automated machines. Worshippers visited temples with self-opening automatic doors. Audiences flocked to automated puppet theaters. And ancient texts even tell of chariots flying through massive temples, seemingly on their own. By the third century BC, the city had become an ancient techno park where sophisticated machines played a part of everyday life. And at the center of it all was Heron. He was renowned for testing and demonstrating his theories and devices to produce wonder and entertainment. He describes many, many different inventions that were designed to surprise and give the impression of magic. And don't forget he was a showman. His work was to display and make people really excited about engineering. Alexandrian high society kept up with the latest developments in technological innovation, even at their own dinner parties. Richard Windley is an historical model maker and specialist in recreating Heron's amazing devices. We're very fortunate in having most of the translations of Heron's treatise on pneumatics, in which he talks about air pressures, water pressures, the interaction of the two. And in his treatise, he describes a number of objects which are based around these principles. This piece is number 66, and he describes it as a vessel for dispensing a measured quantity of liquid, wine usually being the favorite. But how does the jug measure exactly how much wine to release? Inside the vessel is a valve which is operated by this mechanism at the top, which in turn goes down to this lever which counterbalances the cup at the front. When Richard removes the weight, the wine starts to pour. When the cup is nearly full, the balance tips and the flow of wine stops as if by magic. But how did the dispenser work? The heart of the system is a little valve which sits inside the bottom of the vessel. The Greeks seemed to favor these little conical-shaped gravity valves because they opened and closed very quickly. The little conical weight drops into the orifice of the valve when the cup is heavy enough, and this cuts off the flow of wine from the vessel to the cup. When the weight is removed, the bar drops under gravity. This causes the connecting rod to drop which lifts the valve and the fluid can flow through the conical valve and out of the jug. Now, because the cup is balanced by the weight at the rear, as soon as it reaches a predetermined point dictated by that weight there, the cup will then drop. That arm rises, the valve drops, cuts off the flow of liquid, and so that cycle of the process is finished. It's an absolutely fascinating design. 
and it's the first, probably the first real genesis of control systems that we're aware of. But what if a guest became carried away with the ingenuity of this technological achievement or its wine contents? For people like these, Heron was a prankster. This little invention proves that the ancient Greeks had both a sense of humor and a sense of mischief. It's called a greedy cup, and a host would present this to one of his guests who had perhaps a reputation for enjoying his cups. And what would happen is that when the chalice or calyx was partially filled with wine, it would just act as a normal cup. But as soon as the guest said, no, you know, fill it up, top up the, the cup, the little siphon in the center of the cup suddenly starts to, to operate and the entire contents of the cup are dumped onto the person's lap all over the clothes of the unsuspecting guest. Hidden within the center column of the cup is a pipe with a bend. There is an opening to this pipe at the bottom of the cup. When the liquid in the cup reaches a level higher than the bend, air pressure forces the liquid through the tube, up and around and out of the cup. The liquid continues to flow even as the level drops below the bend because of a difference in air pressure between this height and the bottom of the tube. The liquid continues to run down the tube and all over the unsuspecting guest. <laughs> An ancient practical joke. But Heron was interested in much more than party tricks. He utilized a deceptively simple invention to fantastic effect. It is simply called the cam. As the disc rotates, the rod moves up and down. It may sound simple, but this ingenious and deceptively simple device translates circular motion into lateral motion. This allows a wheel to produce a push or a pull. Also, if used backwards, a push or a pull can be converted into circular motion. This is how the piston's movement is converted to circular movement in the camshaft of an engine. This exact principle is used in all engines, right up till the modern day. For all of Heron's brilliance, he had yet to design his masterpiece, an entire theater whose actors were robots. The modern library of Alexandria is a stunning architectural achievement. But Alexandria was a hotbed of technological innovation over 2,000 years ago. And at the cutting edge of this new wave of ingenuity and innovation was a man called Heron. Many of Heron's inventions had practical applications, but he also excelled in the art of creating mechanisms for entertainment. Mechanical technology was also used in the service of public Entertainment. Ancient audiences became increasingly sophisticated, wanted more and more visual entertainment. One of Heron's biggest challenges was to create technologically advanced entertainment systems. One idea he dreamed of was a theater with no actors, only robots. In Dublin, Ireland, robotics and automata designer Mick Kelly has created a replica of this incredible theater. First, they'll see the theater with the doors closed, and then the doors will open for them, and they'll see little men in the back, on the back of the stage, making ships, and then hands will start to move, and they'll hammer, and they'll saw. Backdrops fall into place, and actors and scenery move about the stage, all at exactly the right time. But how did Heron ensure that each event happened in the correct order? Unbelievably, all these actions are driven by a single event. When Mick pulls the release switch from a sand tube, a weight falls. This weight is attached to a camshaft that turns and pulls on strings. And they make it revolve. And as that revolves, it pulls the other strings that are off that and winds them around it, shortening their length. These strings are attached to pins. When these pins are released, parts of the scenery are allowed to fall under gravity. Other pins release secondary weights, which fall and pull extra strings, which move the other features around the stage. Heron's theater is a highly complex automatic machine. But what is incredible is it is also programmable. Those strings are different lengths, and that determines when 
a mechanism is going to operate. So to change the length of a string will effectively program to do something else. Amazingly, what looks like a simple toy is actually one of the first pieces of automated programmable machinery ever created by the human mind. There were two principles used by Heron in his automated machines. The first, used in machines like the theater, relied on weighted moving parts, ropes and wires and cams. But Heron invented a second breakthrough in automation, the world's first hydraulic systems. One of Heron's favorite mechanisms appeared to be a device whereby air pressure is produced by water moving from one vessel into another. As the water runs into the vessel, the air is compressed and has to move somewhere, so it's usually piped to possibly a sound producing or movement producing device. Today, this technology is known to science as pneumatics. Pneumatics is all about the way in which air and gas move and how air and gas can be used to move things. Heron's books clearly show an understanding of the mechanics of air. He knew that air had substance, it had volume, it was made of particles and if you pushed it, it would have to go somewhere and if you sucked it, it would come with you. But could Heron apply these theories to the real world? An opportunity arose when he was challenged to create a garden of birds that could move and sing in the total absence of humans, or birds. We have reports from visitors to the Byzantine court of numerous mechanical devices, one of which was a tree which contained metallic singing birds. The model works on the basis of water falling from one vessel to another, displacing the air and blowing a series of small water warblers which are contained within the birds. The water enters the system through the lion's mouth and drops into a bowl. From there, it runs down into the next vessel below, which is a sealed container. So as the water rushes in, the air in the container is forced out, along the tubes and out of the mouths of the warblers, where there are whistles to make the noise. When that container becomes full, it then siphons suddenly into the lower container, and as that fills, the weight of that vessel actually operates the owl, which then turns to look at the birds. As that lower vessel fills up, it reaches a point almost to fall and then siphons. The weight then decreases dramatically because the water's going out. The vessel then rises under the influence of the counterbalance weight, turning the owl back into its original position. This makes it a kind of loop system whereby it completes one cycle and then immediately resets itself and starts again. So as long as power is being supplied, the system will cycle continuously. And really, in a sense, this makes it a, perhaps a precursor of what we would now call a robotic machine. It would have amazed an audience who had never seen metal recreations of nature moving and making sounds independently of life. motivation behind most of these pieces was to create awe and a sense of mystery and to just to accentuate the power, the wealth and the technical expertise of the culture. Heron was a master engineer. He was a master craftsman. He made things happen. He saw the opportunity and he put it together to the limit of the fabrication methods available to them at the time. Heron was truly a giant in the field of early advances in robotics and automated machines. But he was standing on the shoulders of a giant himself, Phelan of Byzantium. Phelan is responsible for setting in motion many of the ideas used by Heron and inventors throughout history, right up till the present day. Like many of today's inventors, Phelan was called upon to create automatic machines that would make his benefactors money. Religion played an intrinsic part in life in ancient Alexandria. And it was important that the worshippers be pure before entering the temples where they believed their gods actually lived. How could the worshippers ensure there would be a ready supply of soap and water at the temple to purify themselves? And could the priests capitalize on this demand to gain revenue for their holy places? This device is called Philon's automatic soap dispensing machine, and it works like this. 
On the side of the machine is a coin slot here, which would have collected money from worshippers uh, visiting the temple. The coin lands in a pan on one end of a lever. The weight causes this end to go down. The other end of the lever pulls upwards and releases a valve that allows water to flow. So when a coin was placed in there, a supply of water would be turned on. And as the vessel filled up, the weight of the vessel would act on a counterbalance shaft. The weight of the full pot turns wheels that are attached to strings. The strings pull open the doors to the machine and at the same time cause a hand to lower. Which presents the worshipper with a ball of soap or in this case pumice. The hand returns to the interior of the machine and is automatically reloaded with soap. After a few seconds, the vessel reaches its siphon point and it dumps the water in a fairly continuous stream for several seconds down through the device, through the pipe in the lion's mouth, thus allowing the worshipper to actually wash their hands using the pumice ball. These examples of technology designed by Phelon are some of the very earliest machines that we could truly call automatic. For a device which is something like 2,250 years old, this is just mind-blowing. It's a staggering achievement. The exact same principles of this machine still drive many of our machines today, nearly two and a half thousand years later. One could argue that this device was the forerunner of the modern soap dispensers that you find in washrooms. Phelan, Heron, and others in the Alexandrian school created the world's prototype robots and automated machines. Machines that self-regulate. Machines that always do the same thing time after time. And there was a special need for exactly this capability in ancient China. The ancient Chinese were impressive long-range traders, map makers, and adventurers. But it was important to them that they always knew which was home, and especially in which direction lay the fabulous holy city and capital of their empire, Beijing. How could the ancient Chinese inventors solve the problem of always being sure in which direction lay their capital? The answer lay in a high-tech chariot mounted with a programmable direction finder. At all times, the figure which was mounted on top of the chariot would point to the capital city. Ludo Verheyen of MTE Studios has reconstructed a full-scale model of this fascinating machine. Yeah, this project was indeed uh, quite a challenge. It was the first time that this, um, these uh, features have been reconstructed ever, and the mechanics involved was really a challenge. As Ludo rotates the device, we can see that the statue on the top always points the same way, whichever way the chariot turns. But how does it work? It's a highly sophisticated geared mechanism, which is very, very similar to the device that we find in almost every modern car, which we would now call a differential gear. The gear box effectively is measuring the speed between two wheels. As one wheel moves faster than the other, as it does when turning a corner, it alters the position of the figure which is mounted above the chariot. When the cart turns to the right, the right-hand wheel turns a cog inside the machine. This turns the central gear which rotates the figure. Because the right-hand gear has rotated more than the left, the figure is turned more toward the left. So as the cart turns right, the figure turns left to compensate. The result is it seems that the pointing statue has not turned at all and always points in the same direction. No matter where the chariot moves, how it twists and turns, the figure should always remain pointing in the same direction. All the Chinese travelers would have to do is orientate the statue on departure and it would remain pointing in that direction for the entire duration of the journey. To all intents and purposes, I think it would be fair to claim that this is a robotic device. It was an incredibly important invention and has had a huge impact on the technology of the last hundred years in particular. But there is intriguing evidence that the ancients designed machines that could perform several actions all at the same time. Could the world's first supercomputer have been designed almost a thousand years ago?
The science of robotics was surprisingly advanced in the ancient world. But how were their machines powered? If you go back 2,000 years, they didn't have batteries, they didn't have electrical outlets, and this was a real problem for them. One of the most reliable sources of energy in the ancient world was water. And one of the most complex water-driven autonoma was a forerunner of today's synthesizer organs. Rodney Briscoe is fascinated by these ancient machines. The water rises in the top of the tank here, where it falls through these tubes. You get a vortex and it sucks in air. So you get a mixture of air and water, then descending into the tank at the bottom, where the water would pass out, and the air pressure would then be transferred to the organ. And the air passes up into the wind chamber here, where the, the cylinder turns, is operated by the water wheel, by the same water from the tank at the top. It opens the valves and lets the air through into the pipes, and the pipes play. Let's try it. In ancient times, they would have used a waterfall. Today, we are simulating the effect of water falling under gravity using an electric pump. There, the water is now entering the top chamber and falling down into the system below to create the air. And it's now turning the wheel and making the music, just as it would have done thousands of years ago. Pins on the rotating drum lift levers that open the valves and allow the air into the pipes. But there was a machine in the ancient world that used water not for power, where water was the central part of the mechanics itself. At the temple in Karnak, an intriguing find was discovered during a major excavation. They came upon a huge cache of uh, statues that had been buried at some point in antiquity. And among these statues was a very interesting artifact. It was an alabaster jar dated by inscription to the reign of Amenhotep III. And that's about uh, 3,000 years ago. Although this incredibly ancient find may look like a simple container, it would be useless for storing any liquids. The pot has a built-in leak. Water would be put into the jar and would flow out at a controlled rate. And this served as a timing device. Small holes down the sides of the urn indicate how much water has escaped. All the priest would have to do is examine how full the pot was, and they could tell how much time had passed since the clock was filled. It is the ancient world's first water clock. But is there evidence from the ancient world of technically advanced clocks that kept time permanently? Clocks that were fully automated. The search begins in the 400-year-old library of St. John's College in Oxford, England. Here, there are writings that are over a thousand years old. Dr. Emily Savage-Smith from the Oxford University Department of Oriental Studies is researching an ancient inventor, robotics engineer, and clockmaker. His name is Al Jazari. Al Jazari, in 1206, composed a treatise on ingenious mechanical devices in which he described roughly 50 devices in great detail. The Topkapi Library in Istanbul, Turkey, amazingly still contains copies of this ancient manuscript. Within its pages are contained some of the most important breakthroughs in engineering the world has ever known, written by Al Jazari himself. He's important because it happens that his is the only treatise that we have preserved today that does this. Al Jazari was part of a new wave of Middle Eastern inventors, inventors that understood the importance of the Alexandrian proto-robot designers that had come before. They had obviously read Heron of Alexandria, and we know that it was translated in Baghdad at that time. Building on the innovations of the Alexandrians, Al Jazari created one of the ancient world's most complex and impressive automated machines designed to keep time. In the Ibn Battuta Mall in Dubai, ancient historians have created a model of this impressive machine. It is known as the castle clock. At regular intervals throughout the day, the clock performs certain specific actions. Signs of the zodiac rotate around the top of the clock. A moon travels along the top, opening doors to show the passing hours. Falcons drop a ball every half an hour, and every hour, the robot musicians play. 
behind the clock, we can see the ingenious arrangement of mechanics that drive this sophisticated series of events. Water drains out of a vertical tube under gravity. In this barrel is a float that lowers with the height of the water. This pulls a rope, which rotates the disc, giving the signs of the zodiac. This rope also pulls a trolley to which is attached the crescent moon, which moves along the front. And rods on the trolley activate the opening of the doors exactly as the moon passes. As the trolley passes set points, it releases balls that run down a tube and out of a falcon's mouth into the bowl. Meanwhile, the water that was draining from the vertical tube runs into a basin. When this reaches its siphon point, it rushes out past a water wheel. This water wheel is attached to a camshaft. Cams on the shaft knock on levers attached to the musicians at the front, who move and play. Amazingly, it was said that the clock kept very accurate time, hundreds of years before clockwork and the harnessing of electricity or the use of servos. But there is an even more intriguing element of the clock. In the medieval Islamic world, the day was divided into 12 hours between sunrise and sunset. This meant, as the days got longer in summer or shorter in winter, the clock would have to be reprogrammed to a different length of hour. This would be done every day. Making Al Jazari's castle clock truly one of the world's first programmable supercomputers. Al Jazeera can be regarded as the person who invented the first robot. Yet for all of the advancement of the ancients, there remains one amazing invention that stands apart. A fully automated, self-propelled, ancient, programmable robot. The concept of the robot captures the human imagination. The idea of artificial pets, servants, warriors, or entertainers has enthralled human beings since records began. But is there evidence that the engineers of the ancient world were creating exactly this type of robot hundreds of years ago? Is it possible that there were artificial humans and animals in antiquity? Throughout Chinese history, there have been stories of magical and fantastical machines that imitated human figures doing all sorts of activities. And the little gadget I've got here is actually of a serving girl. And the idea is that she will carry a glass of uh, wine or drink to one of the guests at the dinner table. The model performs a predetermined circuit of the table. This ancient android is powered by a coiled spring that is wound by the operator, exactly the same way we might wind a watch or clock today. This spring drives a large central cog. The central cog is connected to several other smaller cogs, each with their own function. It is the complicated and sophisticated interaction of these smaller cogs that produces the range of movements that the girl performs. An amazing achievement hundreds of years before the complex machines of the European Industrial Revolution. We should not be surprised that the ancients had robotic technology. They were not fools. They had mechanism. They had power. They had vision. But the tea girl always repeats the same moves. To really see a self-propelled automatic programmable robot, we must turn to the most famous inventor in history, Leonardo da Vinci. Could Leonardo really have created a self-propelled, fully programmable robot? Remarkably, ancient texts tell us that 500 years ago, during an official ceremony, Leonardo presented a stunning gift to the King of France. And we know for sure the King of France once witnessed the robot because it was a big celebration. As onlookers watched in amazement, a lion walked with no wires or any help or interaction across the floor of the throne room. And it came out to the King of France, opened its chest and gave him flowers, and everybody was stunned. 
Today, using modern technological research, might it be possible to reconstruct Leonardo's lion? The challenge is monumental. Leonardo's blueprints of the robot lion have been lost to history. After Leonardo died, his manuscripts got spread everywhere. Lots of them got lost, about two thirds of them, and lots of others got cut up and put in different pages. At a robot laboratory in Florence, Italy, Leonardo robot expert Laura Stiatesi works with the latest in computer modeling software. The biggest problem was to produce a lion that had a range of movements, but furthermore, that all these movements would be powered by springs without the aid of any motor or electrical input whatsoever. Also on the team is ancient robotics expert Luca Garai. In a 300-year-old library in Bologna, Italy, Luca is trying to piece together the clues in Leonardo's sketches and discover the mechanisms within the lion that made it programmable. The first person to actually program mechanisms was Leonardo during the Renaissance. He drew on some ideas from the Arabs and maybe the Chinese via the Arabs. But he was the very first to actually create a programmable machine. The historians will have to search through the remnants of what evidence Leonardo left us and use all their powers of deduction. Might robotics specialists, historians, and model makers be able to decode the sketches in the Codex Atlanticus? To recreate the first fully automated programmable ancient robot using only ideas set out by Leonardo himself. We were very determined not to use any modern technologies or to take any shortcuts that were not available back then. Using only technologies understood by Leonardo, the researchers create this beautiful reconstruction, a complete replica of the world's first ever fully programmable robot. Moving under its own power, this replica of an ancient robot lion walks across the floor, exactly as it had when Leonardo presented it over 500 years ago. But how did the researchers ensure that the lion would perform its functions correctly and in time? The researchers discover that all the lion's functions are driven by a central drum. This gets its motive power from a coiled spring that must be wound up. This component drives several hundred individual cogs, each with its own function. One group might move the head, another the chest, but how would they set the timings of each function? Leonardo would have employed a technique known as gear ratios that is still used in modern machines today. For every turn of the main drive, other cogs turn faster, depending on their size. A cog half the size turns twice as fast. By programming the ratios between the large central cog and all the others, the operator would be able to set how many turns each cog made in relation to another. This would enable them to set the timing of each individual action and program the movement of the lion, exactly as Leonardo would have done 500 years ago. The feelings that everyone who worked on the project had were similar to what it must be like for a mother to see her child walk for the first time. The satisfaction of seeing a machine powered by its own internal mechanics with no auxiliary power, petrol, or electricity was incredible. It is amazing to think that before batteries, electronic power sources, and computers, the ancients were creating programmable robots at this level of sophistication. I'm really impressed by the incredible skill of the early people. I mean, they did the real development. From the proto-robots of Alexandria to the technological wizardry of Leonardo da Vinci, we are finally understanding the history of robotics. The genesis of machines goes way back at least 2,000 years to the Greeks and probably a lot longer with the Chinese. We have really precise engineering, but we wouldn't have that precise engineering without the crude engineering prototypes that were created by the geniuses of the past. 
Today, we believe that we invented the machines that power our way of life. But is that true? Hydraulics, advanced machines, and the world's first androids were all part of everyday life in the ancient world. What still remains to be discovered, and what we will have to one day acknowledge, is that our claims to invention are thousands of years too late. The ancient Chinese brought inventions into existence that changed the world forever. Machines built on a scale and level of sophistication that was unrivaled for millennia. Many of their inventions redefined engineering. But perhaps their most lasting legacy lies in one area, a sphere of technological innovation in the field of war. At over 6,000 years old, China is one of the planet's most ancient civilizations and today boasts the largest army in the world. 60 centuries of military heritage has left an incredible legacy of technologically advanced weapons. Now, new discoveries are making us realize that much of what we thought we invented actually existed thousands of years ago. Armies that used handguns, landmines, and massive attack catapults to destroy whole towns. Lethal flamethrowers that rained fire on the attackers. High velocity cannons and lethal incendiary bombs that blasted whole battalions out of existence. And even self-propelled missiles. Machines of war that would be instantly recognizable to the frontline troops serving in today's armies. Most of the, the weaponry used in modern warfare has its roots originally in China. Chinese military innovators were thousands of years ahead of their time. The Chinese throughout a lot of history have been at the absolute cutting edge of military technology. Incredibly, their use of gunpowder and military rockets is stunningly similar to the way we use them in battle today. It's certainly one of their major contributions, for better or for worse, to the history of the world. There's no doubt that through a lot of history, the Chinese have been the greatest military innovators on Earth, and their technology ha has certainly been at the absolute forefront. In 400 BC, China was not a unified country. Several states existed in the area, and they were all trying to take control. The state that could take control of its neighbors would win the greatest prize, domination of China. And to beat their neighbors in battle, the Chinese military engineers accelerated the development of killing machines. In the Bronze Age, around 800 BC, Warfare in China relied on hand-to-hand -hand combat and the sword. Chinese blacksmiths were producing amazing advances in metalworking. The result was an array of axes, knives, and swords, the most lethal blades the world had ever seen. The craftsmanship that went into a Chinese sword was extraordinary. They forged iron with carbon to produce ultra-hard blades set into hilts of exquisite craftsmanship. They used an ingenious approach to cooling the blade in the forge, where the middle was coated in a heat-resistant substance that allowed the edge to cool quicker than the middle. The result was a very strong and very sharp weapon. As their skill with metal grew, so did the length of the blades they could produce. In the kingdom of Qin, swords became longer, about 36 inches, and this gave a good advantage in combat. The longest swords in Europe at the time were only 27 inches long. To make long swords, advanced technology was needed to assure their sharpness and flexibility. Swordsmiths had mastered the chemical properties of metal, in particular chromium plating, an extremely complex chemical process. The result was an incredible level of hardness and durability. The sword still shines and has not gone rusty after 2,200 years. This is a result of the chromium plating on it. 
how could the Chinese swordsmiths have coated the eight-sided blades with this chromium? With no electricity 2,200 years ago, the chromium plating must have been done by a chemical method. Something rich with chromium was wiped on the weapons, or the weapons were buried with chromium and heated up. The answer is still a mystery. But even after 2,000 years, the swords have the cutting precision of a modern-day razor. At point-blank range, a trained swordsman could deliver the point of the sword into an enemy with a force of 3,000 pounds, enough to drive through armor, flesh, and bone. Each sword has eight surfaces, and every line on each surface is beautifully crafted. The most important thing is that the blades are really sharp. This is actually as sharp as a razor. At the Tangxi Sword Factory in Keping, modern craftsmen are still creating these exquisite weapons in the same way they were crafted two millennia ago. The iron is forged in furnaces heated to 1130 degrees, just using air and charcoal. The sword is then pounded with a heavy hammer. This flattens the sword into a very thin blade and also hardens the metal. This process, known as tempering, is repeated time and time again. At each stage, the sword becoming harder, thinner, and more deadly. Attention is paid to the smallest details on the beautiful hilts, and the result is an exquisite creation, part work of art, part deadly weapon. But were there even longer blades wielded in ancient China? Dr. Tom Richardson is curator at the Royal Armouries in Leeds, England. The armouries boast one of the largest collections of rare military hardware on the planet. Here lies one of the most unique weapons of the ancient world, a dagger axe. It was called the Ge. This beautifully engineered pointed bladed weapon was originally fastened onto a 10-foot staff. The dagger axe inflicted massive punishment over two and a half thousand years ago. Today, only the bronze blade itself remains. The uh, fluke at the back of the blade passes through the haft, and the slots here on the back of the blade uh, are intended to bind the blade onto the haft. The weapon's precision design ensured that the blade could be used to maximum effect in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Each blow would deliver a force of 6,000 pounds. To be on the receiving end of just one thrust would have been agonizing. They're swung on very long hafts, and you can imagine the concussive impact of one of these blades swung on the end of a long pole. By 1000 AD, China was over 1,000 years old and had consolidated her military might. Her engineers and blacksmiths were becoming expert at creating deadly weapons. But it was the chemists and alchemists who stumbled across a mixture that would completely rewrite the history books and redefine the art of war like nothing before or since. The art of warfare would be unrecognizable today were it not for a thousand-year-old Chinese invention. The first we hear about gunpowder in ancient China is actually from philosophical Taoist tracts. Uh, these were scientists looking for elixirs of immortality, and what they found was in fact the exact opposite. The art of warfare was changed forever. The introduction of gunpowder was the first time that any kind of energy other than human muscle had been applied to warfare. Until that time, everything had to be done by either human or animal muscle. Gunpowder harnessed chemical energy, which could be released over a very short period of time, and gave that enormous power into the hands of the military. The first place that that happened was China. But how is this world-changing substance made? It turns out to be a fairly simple recipe. John Naylor is an expert in the history of military hardware. The basis of gunpowder and any sort of explosive is the fuel. In this case, the fuel is charcoal. We need to powder it, grind it down. In fact, it often works best to have a mixture of coarse and fine powdered charcoal. Powdered charcoal is mixed with two other common chemicals in precise proportions. Mixed together and ground very carefully. 
you end up with your black powder. The bowl and spoon John is using are made of pure silver. John cannot risk using steel or any other metals that can spark when banged together. The reason is obvious. The three of them combined, mixed together, turn innocuous chemicals into the driving force of warfare for nearly a 1,000 years. Having stumbled upon the ultimate ingredient for weapons of war, China realized its potential and launched large-scale production. The first evidence of industrial production of gunpowder in China is dated to 1040 AD, and initially not for use as an explosive, but rather as a fire-producing compound. Gunpowder has different properties depending on the exact proportion of its ingredients, and early varieties of gunpowder didn't explode, but they simply burnt at varying speeds. So that the, the most useful application at that date was either as an incendiary thrown um, from a catapult inside a, a soft paper casing that would burst into flames on impact, or a match which would continue to burn quite slowly for several hours and could be held in front of a, of a stream of, of inflammable oil. With the right mix of gunpowder, military engineers developed a sparky fuse that would lead to the emergence of a new and terrifying weapon, the flamethrower. When the flamethrower was first used by the Germans in the First World War, it came as a, a terrible surprise to the Allies and was regarded as, as a, a particularly horrific example of, of the way that modern warfare was going. Um, I think it would have been a surprise to anyone at the time to realize that flamethrowers had been in use for nearly a 1,000 years in China. Throwing or projecting fire was not a new tactic in warfare. Greek fire had been in use for several hundred years before that. But the Chinese advance on this was to produce a continuous stream of flammable liquid this ancient flamethrower was among the first to utilize liquid fuel. This flamethrower is from the Song Dynasty. It was made to use gasoline, which had been used in China very early on. The liquid properties of gasoline meant it could be sprayed out of a nozzle. This was then ignited at the muzzle by a piece of slow match impregnated with gunpowder. So this was not only the first continuous action flamethrower, but it was also the first known use of gunpowder uh, in military technology. In a remote location, somewhere in rural England, we are about to test a replica of this ancient weapon. Richard Windley is an ancient technology expert who is intrigued by the design of the gunpowder fuse. Certainly the ignition details we have for the flamethrower from the original text indicate that it was some kind of very slow burning but sparky fuse which gave plenty of sparks but burned relatively slowly. It'd be no good having a fuse that burned quickly because it would just burn away and there wouldn't be enough um, ignition there for the thing to keep up a continuous stream. But what flammable agent would the ancient Chinese pyro commandos have used in their weapons? We think that what they were using was something similar to gasoline or, or kerosene. So um, what I'm actually using in this device is a mixture of the two. With the chemistry of the fuse and the incendiary understood, Richard researched the ancient texts for clues as to how the flamethrower actually worked. So this is uh, our reconstruction of the uh, Chinese flamethrower. Basically what we have is a brass cylinder. The quality of the brass was actually specified in the original document and this forms the cylinder of a pump. Inside here is a piston, which is about so big. This would probably be made out of bronze or possibly wood, and it would be bound round with cord until it was a really snug, tight fit in the cylinder so we can get plenty of pressure. This moves backwards and forwards as the handle is moved backwards and forwards. On the forward stroke, it, it forces out the flammable liquid through a nozzle at the front of the device, and on the back stroke, it forces the fluid which is in here it forces that down through that pipe there, up through an internal pipe here, and to a secondary nozzle at the front. So we're effectively getting two squirts, one on the forward stroke and one on the backward stroke. At the back of the flamethrower is a large diameter extension to the cylinder, and this forms what we'd now call a gland. This would have been packed with string or cardboard, and the purpose of this is to stop the fluid on the backstroke being forced out and covering the operator. 
The reservoir is in the bottom. Initially, uh, in the original device, the whole thing, this whole tank, would have been a large reservoir, which would probably be holding something like 25 litres. There is a small flap valve made of brass, which has a pivoted hinge. This allows the fuel to be drawn up into the cylinder on the forward push and along this tube, rather than back into the reservoir on the second stroke and into the secondary nozzle ignition chamber at the front. The ignition system is a slightly different uh, proposal because the texts are not that clear on how exactly this worked. The little um, fuse assemblies are going to fit just inside a little holder there. Uh, they're ready to be lit. The front portion, the ignition chamber goes on. Then what all remains to do now is to light the fuse and uh, we're ready, pretty much ready to shoot. Richard sets up a bale of hay 60 feet away from the flamethrower. This will enable us to see how accurate the weapon is. The flamethrower fires burning gasoline over 60 feet and instantly incinerates the target Richard has set up, a devastating weapon of war. Well, um, that, that, from where I was standing, that was absolutely staggering. That was awesome. And um, to see that, that stream of fire coming at you must be absolutely devastating. So where was the best tactical position to place a flamethrower? They, they were used in a whole host of different ways. They were used on board ship. They were used um, on ramparts as defences for fortifications and almost act as a kind of spearhead for the frontline troops. We know from 20th century experience that the flamethrower is one of the most terrifying weapons that anyone can face. And certainly there would have been a serious risk of being burnt if you were in front of it. But they were fairly short-ranged weapons. And a lot of the time their value would have been psychological. If a flamethrower of, of that description was, was guarding a breach in a city wall, it would have been a very brave man who would have attempted to go through it. But many military objectives are further away than 60 feet. There is amazing evidence that the Chinese designed and built weapons that could fire devastating projectiles over a mile. Before the advent of gunpowder in China in 1000 AD changed the art of warfare, the Chinese had long been shooting projectiles across battle lines using the crossbow. But there is intriguing evidence that the Chinese military engineers took crossbow technology to its ultimate limit. In Chinese archives lies a rare copy of an ancient text, The Essentials of the Military Arts, written in the 11th century. It is a magnificent document on ancient Chinese warfare. Within its pages are fascinating glimpses of complex and awe-inspiring machines. One such machine was the triple crossbow, an incredibly powerful siege weapon. The triple crossbow was a 25-foot long device that employed not one, but three bows to give it extreme power. This was a heavy-duty assault weapon that needed a whole team of men just to arm the beast. This is the largest long-range weapon. The original model would be twice as big, twice as long as this model. Mostly it's used to defend, but it could certainly be used for attack. It has fierce power from these triple bows. It would take ten soldiers or more to turn the axle and to load the string on the trigger. But what kind of ordnance could this monster unleash? The arrows for the siege crossbow were huge. They were made from iron and could fly as far as a mile. These 10-foot full metal jacket tipped missiles would have smashed through anything they met. But despite its gargantuan size, the siege crossbow was a mobile and versatile weapon. The giant siege weapon was mounted on a pivot and axle, allowing it to be targeted quickly and with precision. Once the weapon had a target in its sights, the power straining to unleash the missile would be freed by banging the trigger with a hammer. 
the ability to threaten a town with a single weapon provoked a rush to develop countermeasures and defenses within Chinese city walls. And where the defenders built higher and wider, the aggressors built taller and stronger. Perhaps the most effective of the ancient Chinese siege attack weapons was the whirlwind catapult. Acting like a heavy-duty sniper rifle, the whirlwind could release a projectile with pinpoint accuracy at any part of the town wall or its inhabitants. Western siege catapults of the time worked by pulling down a massive weight, loading the projectile, and then releasing the weight. The whirlwind was different. There was no weight. Instead, a squad of 10 men would pull down on the short end of the lever, hurling the 120-pound ball up to a quarter of a mile. This meant that the whirlwind was a very light and mobile multiple-use weapon and could be deployed anywhere around a siege or even in open battle. But there's more. Western catapults needed a solid frame to support the great weight. The elite whirlwind catapult was supported by just a single pole. This gave it another advantage. The advantage of the whirlwind catapult was the mobility and flexibility that it provided in contrast to the larger siege engines which were basically static. A whirlwind catapult could be mounted on a tower or a city wall and used to command a very wide arc of fire or alternatively on the battlefield it could be rushed quickly to any place where massed firepower was required. In ancient texts, there are accounts of whirlwinds forming parts of batteries of thousands of catapults, which could lay devastation to entire cities within hours. But the purpose of a siege was not always to obliterate the enemy town. Often, the objective was to overrun the city with infantry. There is evidence in the texts of large assault machines known as cloud bridges. Their name might sound peaceful, but their purpose was anything but. This 10% scaled-down model is one that incorporates an extendable ladder. The ancient Chinese invented this siege machine with the name Cloud Bridge, meaning very tall bridge. It has wheels and it could be pushed forward until it reached the wall. Soldiers could safely hide inside the machine until the wall was reached. Stepping on this ladder, the city walls could be climbed onto. You can imagine in a battle scores of cloud bridges being pushed forward and hundreds or thousands of soldiers climbing the ladders. Cloud bridges were really powerful in ancient wars. And some of the cloud bridges were truly massive, driven by teams of oxen. The main point of this type of machine is to get attacking troops on top of the city wall. So it was obviously important as the height of walls increased that the, the height of the machines was increased to match them. But no weapon of war is invincible. The normal way of attacking this kind of wooden siege engine was obviously to set it on fire. Um, this could be done simply by throwing burning materials at it or in a later period by the use of burning oil or flamethrowers. So the logical counter was to cover the machine with uncured hides, which would be very difficult to burn, keep them soaked with water, um, and in that way armor them and the people inside against missiles at the same time as you make them fireproof. And if the attackers breached the city walls, there were lethal defenses waiting for them. The ancient world's equivalent of razor wire. This battle machine is called a San Yuan knife cart. It's a two-wheeled cart installed with knives. Its major function is in the eventuality that the gates failed to hold or the city walls were breached. It would be rolled into place to block up streets and defend them. The knife cart was as effective as razor wire, with one improvement. It was mobile and could be deployed wherever the defender's need was greatest. But just like razor wire, it could fit any gap. In the ancient wars, a practical cart was built according to the size of gates or width of streets. I think it would be twice the size of this, at least. 
But not all heavy military hardware was used in urban conflict. At first sight, it might look like it was designed to scale city walls, but this machine had a more intriguing purpose. This is a military machine used in ancient Chinese warfare with the name nest cart. It is actually a small house that can be lifted up and down to scout. In the middle area of China, the lands are mainly flat, which makes it difficult to see far on the enemy's side. With this device, we could see the enemy's situation from high. Military satellites fill the tactical role of the nest cart in modern warfare. However, there are ancient Chinese weapons that were developed nearly a millennium ago, whose basic technology is little changed from that used by our armed services today. The Chinese innovated the greatest revolution in warfare technology the world has ever seen, the gun. The range and ingenuity of Chinese weapons of war is incredible, but it wasn't until the invention of gunpowder that Chinese military hardware entered the modern era, and ancient Chinese armies began to use a weapon that would be recognizable to the modern soldier. By the 10th century, weapons called fire lances, bamboo tubes filled with kinds of gunpowder mixed with fragments of iron, ceramic shards, things like that. They were set fire to, you advance towards the enemy, and these things spit fire and various bits of poison ceramics. At the same time, new compositions of gunpowder were being developed, which produced much more explosive force and less in the way of, of flames. And when these were combined with the, the principle of the projectile being forced out of a barrel, the result was the development of the gun. In the National Military Museum in Beijing lies a stunning weapon, the world's first handgun. Made in the Shisheng period in 1351, this extraordinary weapon shows characteristics of a modern firearm, including the clearly visible muzzle and firing chamber. The invention of gunpowder weapons certainly revolutionized Chinese warfare, but it did far more than that. Within 40 years, the same technology had spread all the way from China to the west of Europe. And in fact, the use of gunpowder as a propellant, as a weapon, revolutionized world warfare. This is an example of a Chinese gun, probably of the 16th or 17th century, but it's a wrought iron construction with hooped staves around the barrel. And this type of gun appears really very, very early in China. You can see at the center, there's a thickened breech section to reinforce the barrel against the blast as the main charge goes off. And you can see the touch hole where light's applied to it. A fuse would be placed into the hole. When this fuse was lit, it would carry the flame into the breech of the weapon. Inside, the packed gunpowder would explode violently. The entire force of the explosion had nowhere else to go other than to force the projectile out of a long tube towards the hapless target. The bullet is projected out of the gun with incredible force. The same principle which is used in the, the early handguns which have been found um, from medieval China can be applied to very much bigger weapons, um, including cannon large enough to batter down city walls. This is the earliest tube-shaped metal gunpowder weapon in the world. It was made in the year 1332 and is the grandfather of all modern cannons. The calibers and length of the tubes have become bigger through the development of the cannon. This means it can support heavier bombs and bigger trajectories, and the damage done by the cannon becomes bigger and bigger. But the devastation caused by an explosion can be employed as a method of attack in itself, the bomb. There is evidence in ancient texts that the Chinese invented explosive devices with triggering mechanisms nearly 1,000 years ago. A new discovery is forcing us to go back and rewrite the history books. 
there was an ancient Chinese weapon tactically identical to a device used on the battlefields of Vietnam. Could the Chinese have invented the landmine? Most people would expect that a, a landmine would be um, an innovation of the 20th century. But in fact, something very similar was in use in China as early as the 13th century. And by the 15th, it had been developed into a very sophisticated device which could be set off by the pressure of a person's foot. Um, this would release a pin, which would release a weight underground and set off a, a flint and steel detonator. Um, and this would explode a large piece of bamboo stuffed full of gunpowder right underneath the enemy soldiers' feet. This would send shards of bamboo and other shrapnel exploding upwards and through the feet of the enemy, rendering them immobile. But devices like the handgun and the landmine were only possible because the Chinese had a long tradition of creating technologically advanced weapons of war. Over 1,500 years before the landmine and the handgun, Chinese metallurgists were already producing devastating attack weapons. One of these was the high-intensity crossbow. The crossbow is responsible for countless victories in Chinese history, and there were millions of them issued to infantry troops. However, because they are made of wood, surviving crossbows are priceless, rare artifacts. This is an example of one of the very earliest Chinese crossbows. It's just the stock made of wood covered in lacquer and beautifully decorated. It's the trigger mechanism that's at the heart of the Chinese crossbow, and it's an extremely clever device. Triggers are made of extremely precise interconnecting components that must fit and work together with rigorous accuracy. To manufacture them required an incredibly advanced level of casting expertise. And in fact, the technology is quite comparable with a lot used in the gun trade a millennium and a half later. Yet these things were invented in the 4th century BC. The crossbow was a significant technological development over the simple bow that was used for thousands of years by civilizations all over the world. But how is this design more effective than the simple bow? The ordinary bow is formed by an arc and a bowstring. It's pulled by hand, and as a result, the bowman would get tired using it. It's also hard to aim. But the Chinese crossbow is mounted on a frame, and the string is pulled back and held in position by a latch attached to a trigger mechanism. The trigger mechanism could be conceived as the ancestor of the trigger from a modern rifle. The trigger mechanism would enable the bow to be held ready-armed for long periods without tiring the archer, and thus taking aim would be easier. This gives the crossbow an important tactical advantage over other bows. The most significant advantage of the crossbow is that soldiers could use it for ambush. Once they discovered and aimed at targets, they would simply need to pull the trigger. Then the arrow would fly out with incredible power. It only demands the small force of pulling the trigger with a finger, and it would be transformed into a really big force to shoot out the arrow. And when released, the two-pound bolt could fly 300 yards towards the enemy, tearing through armor, flesh, and bone. Crossbow technology and the skill of crafting these elegant assault weapons has not been lost. Yang Fu Shi comes from a long family line of crossbow makers that dates back nearly two and a half thousand years. He still makes bows to an ancient design, using only the tools and materials available to the ancients. <laughs> I couldn't tell you how many generations in my family have been making bows. My ancestors were all bow makers. This looks exactly the same as a crossbow excavated from a West Han tomb. This is a Han Nu crossbow. In Chinese, this means with anger. Its history can be traced back to 2,500 years ago. This replica was made exactly according to ancient drawings. The trigger on this crossbow is made of bronze and exactly the same as the one excavated. 
Many modern tools were used like lathes, mills, and planes. Our ancestors could make these exquisite triggers thousands of years ago without modern tools. Through the process of creating these beautiful replicas, Yang Fuxi has discovered a tactical benefit of the crossbow. The leather strips bound on the chocks are to fasten the bow. The bow can be disassembled to make it convenient to carry on military marches, and then reassembled on the battlefield. But how powerful could a crossbow get, and what was its ultimate range? According to ancient texts, the most powerful crossbow could have a tensile force of up to 260 pounds, it was called crossbow loaded with feet. It could reach over 500 yards. Very deadly. This devastatingly lethal attack weapon could fire 20-inch bolts at the enemy, with a force equivalent to being hit in the chest with a modern 357 bullet. But the Chinese military were continuously developing and refining their arsenals. By 200 AD, they had taken the crossbow to a new lethal level. Centuries before the gun, while the rest of the world relied on the simple bow, the Chinese developed the world's first repeating shooting weapon, the repeating crossbow. It is the ancient world's machine gun. Here on top, we've got a magazine that holds these bolts slotting down into there like that. Holding this lever, working the action, the whole magazine comes forward. The string slips into that notch so it can then be drawn back. It's also holding down a little peg so that when the magazine is steady on the stock, pushes the peg, wallet, shoots the projectile down at the enemy. And as fast as you can work the action, that's how fast you can shoot. With a hundred men to a company, ten companies to a regiment, each with a thousand crossbows, this meant that six or seven thousand bolts would have been tearing across the battlefield at once, instantly cutting down everything in their path. Incredibly, this murderous kill rate would not be seen again until World War I, over 1,500 years later. Now, the beauty of this weapon is it's idiot proof. You don't need to be a trained soldier to use it. It gives the rate of fire that a trained archer can put out, but without all the hardship of learning to do it. It was common at the time for Chinese emperors to have retained armies. This meant that farmers who usually worked the lands of the empire could be called upon to take up arms in defense of their realm. The repeating crossbow was an ideal weapon to issue to an untrained soldier. Thousands of these weapons unleashed onto the battlefield would put doubt in the minds of any attacking force. Firing at a rate of one lethal bolt per second, the repeating crossbow was a unique development, an innovation that incredibly preceded the automated weapons of the 20th century by more than 15 centuries. Although a single bolt from a repeating crossbow would not cause enormous impact, the effect of thousands of them coming at once would have been devastating, especially if we consider that the tips would have been poisoned. A single scratch would have taken out an enemy soldier. But it wasn't until they unleashed the chemical energy in gunpowder that the Chinese brought the firing of missiles across the battlefield into the modern era. By the 11th century AD, the Chinese were starting to project missiles in a way that would be recognizable to a modern military engineer in the gunpowder-fueled rocket. Gunpowder was first used for military purposes in China around 1000 AD. Its initial use in warfare was to create fuses for flamethrowers, but the flamethrower's range is limited by how far the machine can pump the flammable fluid. However, the Chinese had been using the explosive power of gunpowder in fireworks for entertainment. They also had hundreds of years' experience of unleashing projectiles at an enemy. It was just a matter of time before they discovered you could combine these two skills. An intriguing discovery by underwater archaeologists off the coast of Japan has uncovered evidence of what are believed to be China's earliest known exploding gunpowder-based projectiles. 
the researchers found something stunning. Two intact and four partial bombs encased in a dense ceramic shell. When the scientists x-rayed two of the intact bombs, they discovered that one was filled with gunpowder and the other not only contained gunpowder, but dozens of pieces of iron shrapnel. They realized what they were looking at, a weapon that was half bomb, half grenade. We now know that ancient Chinese armies had an incredible range of ordnance available to them. From super scale mega crossbows, to handguns and cannons, to devastating flamethrowers, all being deployed nearly a thousand years ago. But now, for the first time, new discoveries have us asking the incredible. Could the Chinese have used rocket-propelled missiles in battle at a time when the rest of the world was throwing stones out of wind-up catapults? In its early years, gunpowder was used mostly for entertainment. They designed spectacular fireworks, almost the same as we use on the 4th of July today. But could this expertise be turned to use in battle? Could the Chinese adapt their rocket technology and create self-propelled weapons of war? Under the Song Dynasty in the 13th century, they were still used only for toys and for firework demonstrations. But soon after that, they began to have a military application. This was well before the use of rockets in warfare anywhere else in the world. The early applications of rocket technology to military uses were basic. They involved attaching a gunpowder-based rocket to an arrow to give the projectile propulsion. Intriguingly, there is evidence of early trials in which rockets were attached to aerodynamic bird-shaped creations. But developments were right around the corner. Under the Ming Dynasty from the middle of the 14th century, rockets began to be used en masse in Chinese warfare. They were fairly small devices with arrowheads on the end of a stick propelled by a rocket tube. They didn't have explosive warheads, so they were most useful when fired en masse. Just like the multiple rocket launchers of today, Chinese rocket launchers caused devastation on the battlefield. It didn't stop there. There was an invention that took rocket technology to the ultimate limit. A piece of military hardware little different to the rockets that modern armed forces put into the field today. The ballistic missile. Invented in the early 14th century, even its name was designed to strike fear into enemy troops. This is an ancient weapon called Fire Dragon issued from water. It was used in naval battles, and when issued, it had a long flame tail, looking like a fire dragon. There are many types of bamboo in China, so it's easy to find the material to build the weapon's body. But how did it work? It has something like fireworks attached to the outside, which act like a powder flask when they are lit. The whole thing starts to fly. The mouth in the front is loaded with gunpowder, which explodes the enemy ship. But there was more to the weapon than that. The rocket was built in two stages. During the flying, the first stage burns, but ignites the second stage. This drives the fire dragon to fly further and reach the enemy ship and explode. But even if the enemy was out of range, the fire dragon had a contingency. There was a magazine of three rocket-driven arrows loaded within the mouth of the missile. Hundreds of fire dragons flying through the air at an enemy fleet would have caused panic and devastation. This fire dragon issuing from the water might be thought of as a sort of primitive cruise missile. Its main use was from one ship um, against an enemy fleet in naval battles, battles on the, the large rivers of China. Um, I think, though, that it, its main impact would have been psychological. The large carved and painted dragon head on the front would probably have had more impact than the, the shower of arrows which it was uh, discharged when it got within range. Um, nevertheless, it's, uh, it's an extremely sophisticated piece of technology for its time. 
It is incredible to think that the Chinese war machine created weapons whose principles and tactics we still use today. The, those first Chinese um, military technicians who first used gunpowder to propel a rocket device forward um, can take as much credit as anyone for putting a man on the moon. Thousands of years ago, they were creating weapons that would be instantly recognizable to the modern soldier. What new discoveries remain out there? Discoveries that will turn everything we thought we knew about the ancient world on its head. Will we have to rewrite the history books? Our common perception is that the machines that power today's world were invented by us in modern times. But is this true? Today, new discoveries from the ancient world are making us take another look and rethink the development of mechanical science. And what we now know about the ancients is causing us to go back and rewrite the history books. While Europe wallowed in the Dark Ages, ancient China reigned supreme as the world's technological superpower. Only now are we beginning to discover that many of the inventions that shape our modern world have their roots in this remarkable civilization of the ancient Orient. Complex geared machines that fueled production on an industrial scale. Precision seismographs for detecting earthquakes drilling machines that bored for natural gas hundreds of feet beneath the Earth. The cosmic engine, a super-scale astronomical computer that not only told the time, but also predicted the passage of the planets and the stars. And even blast furnaces, capable of forging metal on a scale that rivals that in the modern world. Some of these are so complex that for centuries their inner workings remained a mystery. China was always an immense state, much more unified than Europe at the same time. If they were to control the population, they had to organize manufacturing on a very large scale. I regard that as the basis of industrialization. But how did the technology of China become so advanced? And who were the ancient inventors at the forefront of designing these complex and awe-inspiring machines? One discovery in an ancient text is stunning. It describes in detail something that is also vital in modern times, but was actually invented nearly two millennia ago. It is an actual seismograph, an earthquake-detecting machine. It was designed and built by a master inventor named Chang Heng. Chang Heng, who lived during the time of the Romans, would rival Archimedes and Leonardo da Vinci as one of the greatest geniuses of the ancient world. In the second century AD, the seismograph was over one and a half millennia ahead of similar Western technology. The seismograph isn't quite as modern an invention as people perceive. It was invented 2,000 years ago in China. Chan Hang's invention was probably something like 1,600 years ahead of what was done in the West. Today, modern facilities like the Earthquake Administration in Beijing use digital technology to record ground-shaking tremors over large bands of frequencies and seismic amplitudes. But in ancient China, as now, an early warning earthquake system was essential. News traveled slowly across the vast state, how could news of an earthquake reach the rescuers immediately? Chang Heng's seismograph had the answer. The device consisted mainly of a, a massive bronze vessel. Um, this was reputed to be about six feet across. The earthquake machine was a huge vessel of cast bronze, consisting of nine dragons facing outward in a circle. Each dragon gingerly held a ball in its jaws. The instrument was designed so that any seismic tremor would cause the ball to fall from the jaws of the dragon and into the mouth of a frog facing the direction of the tremor. Despite its beautiful exterior, it is the internal mechanisms of the machine that are ingenious, even by today's standards. 
When an earthquake struck, the vibration which was transmitted through the Earth, which actually travels very, very quickly through the Earth's surface, would hit the jar. There was a vertical rod inside the jar, balanced carefully with a weight at its top end. This is known as an inverted pendulum. The seismograph worked by having an inverted pendulum inside it that basically toppled over, and by toppling over in one direction or another, it would impact with a ball and the ball would fall from the side of the seismograph, giving an indication from which direction the earthquake had actually come. The inverted pendulum is an ingenious device. It stands motionless until the slightest vibration sends it toppling over, indicating the direction of the epicenter. We can all picture what a conventional pendulum is if we think of a grandfather clock swinging, it has a pendulum swinging inside it. An inverted pendulum is the exact opposite, where you have a pivot underneath and you're trying to balance that from underneath. But there is another discovery from ancient China that, like the seismograph, is also vital to us today. A technology that delivers the ultimate power source of the modern world. Oil drilling. Today, we assume that it was modern engineers who pioneered the art of deep drilling technology. Yet, incredibly, the techniques for today's supplies of oil and natural gas were actually reinvented from Chinese machines of 2,000 years ago. It's amazing to think that it's 2,000 years ago the Chinese were using the same techniques to drill for uh, salt and for natural gas that we're still using today. The sheer size of the ancient drilling machines was remarkable. Derricks, also known as heaven carts, would rise over 180 feet above the ground. Images which we associate today with the landscape of Texas would not have been uncommon in ancient China. Amazingly, examples of these ancient industrial machines still exist in some regions of China today. This allows scholars a first-hand glimpse of the devices used in these ingenious superscale machines. The drilling rig is constructed from heavy-duty bamboo with the drill suspended by cables. A team of workers stood on a wooden plank lever, much like a seesaw, and this lifts up the drill head made of iron. The pipe is allowed to drop until the drill bites on solid rock and begins to pulverize it. The bamboo cable used in the machine is extremely strong. In fact, its tensile strength is comparable to modern-day steel. The drill stem is pulled from the hole using a large wheel, somewhat similar in appearance to that on a modern flexible cable downhole tool truck. This rig was extremely versatile. To deal with the different rock types, the Chinese even produced a series of drill bits, specifically modified to the different geologies and rock types found in different areas of China. Using these drilling techniques allowed the workers to reach the depths of the earth where salt, natural gas, and oil were at their richest. When extracted from the wells, the gas was raised several feet above ground level and then distributed for hundreds of miles by an elaborate network of pipes. But it was to be in the Song Dynasty at the turn of the first millennium that the rate of industrialization in ancient China reached its zenith. Inventors and engineers were creating colossal, incredibly advanced machines on a scale not seen in the West for more than a thousand years. And the machines they invented used many of the same techniques in manufacturing that we still use today. As well as advances in technological engineering and manufacturing, this period produced the first industrialization and mass production of a substance that would change the world irreversibly. The Song Dynasty lasted from 960 to 1279 AD and was based in the Henan region in eastern China. The dynasty launched a 300-year period of economic growth coupled with great artistic and intellectual achievement. It was during the Song period that the four great inventions of papermaking, printing, 
the compass, and gunpowder were further developed, technologies that spread across the globe and changed the world permanently. Of these four great inventions, perhaps the most lasting legacy of the Song Dynasty was the development that combined three simple chemicals into the most explosive change in world history, gunpowder. This single-purpose but multi-use mixture not only revolutionized warfare, but has led to rocket and missile development, and even the first few steps on a journey of exploration that has put man on the moon. But this period was also marked by stunning advances in manufacturing. In particular, one such area of innovation was in heavy metal manufacturing. In the province of Shantung, one recent discovery has given us remarkable insight into the metal forging abilities of ancient China. It is the remains of a giant cast iron pagoda that dates back to the Song Dynasty. What makes these iron structures so incredible is that casting massive pieces of iron is a challenge even today. How the ancient engineers managed this amazing task is something we find hard to comprehend. To produce and cast quality iron on a mass scale, iron workers today constantly need to keep a massive volume of molten liquid at a very high temperature so as to allow the liquid metal to be poured. The same was true two millennia ago. One way to raise the temperature in a furnace is to blow air in, exactly as we might do when we fan the flames of a barbecue or use bellows on a fire. Modern ironworks use the same principle, but they use electrical air pumps to feed the fire. But how might the ancient Chinese have devised a method of driving massive volumes of air to heat their furnaces? An intriguing discovery at an ancient site has recently given archaeologists clues that automated air bellows machines were, in fact, in use. Drawing on the technological knowledge of their predecessors, who had begun to use water as a motive power, we now believe that engineers created a mechanical system for the operation of the blast furnace bellows. To generate the kind of heat required in a blast furnace, you need quite considerable volume of air. It doesn't need to be incredibly high pressure, but there needs to be a lot of it. And what the Chinese did is they modified a traditional water mill, and they developed a system of bellows which were operated by cranks worked by the water-powered wheel. Dr. Garrett Owen is a specialist in mechanical design and engineering at the University of Bath in England. Using a water wheel as the, the starting power source and you want to drive a bellows, you can drive it using a crank and where you have a central axle and an offset pin and some form of connecting rod and link. So the water wheel will turn the crank in a rotary motion and then all that the crank does with its connecting rod is convert that into a linear motion that you can use to power the bellows. This type of machine is similar in principle to the design of the piston in a steam engine or automobile, but operating in reverse. In the Chinese machine, the wheel turns to operate a crank, whereas the later steam engine would use a piston-driven crank to turn the wheel. The ancient Chinese understanding of engineering allowed automated continuous air blasts to create the high temperatures needed for successful iron casting. Hand in hand with a mastery of casting came other mechanical innovations that were also centuries ahead of their time. The Song Dynasty also produced advances in mass automated manufacturing and high-tech sophisticated machines, some of which laid the groundwork for much modern machinery. One such invention is the ancient world's version of the odometer. An odometer is a simple device that allows you to measure distance in exactly the same way as you have an odometer on the dash of your car. But could the Chinese have invented the gearbox more than a millennium before the modern engine? This fascinating ancient device is known as the rangefinder chariot. The cart, when pulled alongside a marching army, would signal the passing of every 500 yards with the banging of a drum. This model is a small-scale version, 
the actual odometer was much bigger. The real-sized chariot is very big. What you see now is a mini-sized model. We rebuilt this according to the ancient texts. The toothed gears in the machine are driven by the chariot's wheel. It uses what is described by modern engineers as a reduction gear train, a system that lowers the output speed so that one or more pins can revolve slowly, releasing catches at predetermined intervals to trigger the striking of the drums every 500 yards. Experts believe the machine was used to lead the emperor's royal guards on military assignments, to record the distances of enemy camps, or even to measure how far the army had marched from the royal city. When the wheel outside is turned, it drives a small standing gear wheel inside. The large gear wheel drives a small gear flywheel, which again drives a large wheel. A lever on the big wheel will trigger the string to hit the drum when the wheel has turned enough. Now, the little lever is in a position to be triggered. It is triggered, and the string on the drum is hit. What is remarkable about this odometer is that its gear systems match those in today's motorcycle engines precisely. One of the keys to the range-finding chariot was the gear system within it. Uh, and here is an example showing a section motorcycle engine. And this engine is, in, is currently in bottom gear. And you can see that you need a number of turns of the engine in order to make the output sprocket of the motorcycle go along. So this is gearing down the speed of the engine to the speed of the sprocket. The same would have happened in the range-finding chariot, only that it would have been an even greater reduction so that you would have had, for every 500 yards, the main wheel with the trigger would have just turned once. This type of machinery demonstrates that the Chinese possessed an early understanding of the elements that are used in jack work in today's modes of transport. But there is intriguing evidence of the application of gear engineering on a massive industrial scale during the Song Dynasty. One discovery in particular has caused us to rethink everything we thought we knew about ancient manufacturing. We now know that the Chinese had fully operational huge factories capable of mass production. The zenith of ancient Chinese innovation took place during the Song Dynasty, which lasted from 960 to 1279 AD and was based in eastern China. The dynasty launched a 300-year reign of incredible inventions and machines. These inventions revolutionized warfare and would even lead to man exploring space, using navigational instruments that guided mankind's journey of discovery. Only now are we discovering that these intriguing machines fundamentally match the principles of today's modern technology, causing us to ask, did we invent modern machines, or did we just reinvent them? At the height of the Song Dynasty in the 11th century, huge metropolises had begun to develop and were becoming centers for trade, industry, and commerce. These cities, with populations of hundreds of thousands, required automated machines that could increase the output of production. One such ancient industrial machine that has recently been discovered by archaeologists is the hydraulic trip hammer, believed to have first been developed as long as two millennia ago. Today, in the province of Jingdezhen, an example of this extraordinary 2,000-year-old technology is still in use, a testament to the machine's effectiveness and design. A trip hammer is a good example of one of these water wheel powered devices. Basically, you have a large mass that is supported by a cam. And as the cam is rotated, the mass is lifted, uh, and then the mass is allowed to fall. The system is amazingly advanced for its time. The machine actually consisted of several hammers, which were operated by a series of cams or lugs on the main revolving shaft. 
the hydraulic machine converts the kinetic and gravitational potential energy stored in running water into rotational power in a water wheel. The wheel is attached to a long transverse axle. There are several wooden boards inserted into the revolving shaft, with each board controlling one hammer. The wheel causes the shaft to rotate, which in turn moves the lugs. As they turn, these lift the hammers. When they have turned 60 degrees and the hammer is at full height, they release the heavy mallet, which falls and pounds the material below. Each hammer could crush with 100 pounds of force, meaning that all eight hammers would operate a total of 800 pounds of force in a single rotation. The ancient texts tell us that this mega machine was adapted to not only crush grain, but to pound metal in industrialized automated metal workshops, just as we still use today. The labor saving potential is enormous. Instead of perhaps having to have five or six blacksmiths, each with a 10 pound sledgehammer, you could have one 70, 80, 100 pound, 200 pound mass being lifted and dropped a considerably bigger distance. And this could be then used by just one or perhaps two men working. Uh, and that saves you labor, but enables you to make bigger things as well. Today, the remains of mega water wheels which powered the hammers still litter the landscapes of rural provinces, offering a fascinating glimpse of what these hydraulic machines actually looked like. But the Chinese soon invented a more efficient way to grind grains, using millstones. The grain is crushed under a massive stone weight. This is a tried and tested technique, but the ancient Chinese took the technology to an advanced level. This machine is called the multiple geared grist mill. As with the trip hammer machine, the multiple geared mill was also powered by water. However, this machine harnessed the power of the water wheel to drive a complex angled gearing system and power nine separate two ton millstones. Remarkably, the engineers devised an advanced system that transferred the water power via the drive shaft across a 90 degree angle change to drive the millstones. We have this one enormous wheel which has got a shaft fixed to it and on this shaft are a whole series of gears which are providing the motive power and then from these there are a series of right angle gears which are changing the direction of the rotation and allows a whole series of different millstones to be driven off one shaft. This is a very economical way of generating the required power. What is stunning is that this type of gear-powered water mill developed in ancient China incorporated technology that would not be seen again for nearly a thousand years. What we're looking at really is almost a precursor of the Industrial Revolution. This was industrialization on a scale which we would recognize today. The sophistication of ancient Chinese gear technology was highly advanced, but there is even more evidence that the Chinese had a long tradition of ingenious geared machines. Beautiful and grave jade rings were discovered in tombs dating back to 400 BC. The spiral design on the rings is what has intrigued scholars. Incredibly, after studying the design, archeologists believe that the only possible way to produce the precision spirals must have been using a machine. A device known as a compound machine is one that synchronizes rotational with linear motion. This means that as one part of a machine turns the disc, the other draws the line in perfect synchronicity with a geometric accuracy that is impossible to do by hand. Richard Windley has been studying the finds from ancient China and has created a model of a compound machine capable of such precision designs. To produce this kind of curvature would really need a machine which was capable of rotating and moving in a linear fashion at the same time. This is what we call a compound machine. I've actually built a small model which will demonstrate this process. It consists of a turntable on which a blank or disc to be marked out is mounted and a linear rod which moves across it. This rod holds the pen which is going to mark out the spirals and by moving the rod backwards and forwards the pen traverses the blank as the blank is actually rotating and this produces what is known as a true Archimedean spiral. 
but what we also have is a gearing system which relates the movement of this bar and the movement of the turntable in a very controlled mathematical method. There are two uprights attached to the end of the bar that moves the pen across the blank. These uprights are attached to a string which is wound around a disc under the device. So as the bar moves back and forth, the string turns the disc in perfect sync. It is this disc that rotates the blank and creates the perfectly synchronized designs. I'm now going to load the little bamboo brush with drawing ink. Since these rings would have a series of flutes, they varied in number. In my case, I've got eight divisions, so we'll repeat this eight times, and that should give us the perfect, complete design. We now know that this type of compound machine may have been used to mark the jade by the direct action of a diamond-tipped stylus. Over thousands of years, technological innovations filtered slowly but steadily from the advanced east to the west carried through Central Asia over the 4,000-mile Silk Route. But there is a single extraordinary archaeological find that gives us a unique insight into the capabilities of ancient Chinese engineers and craftsmen. The find was only discovered 30 years ago and is so important that it is considered by many to be the eighth wonder of the ancient world. Many ideas and processes for technological masterpieces are simply lost to history. But there are intriguing artifacts that survive from the ancient world, which provide tantalizing evidence that incredibly complex techniques actually existed thousands of years before the modern age. The extraordinary first emperor of China's terracotta army is startling evidence of the magnificence and grandeur of the ancients. It is located in eastern China, and today it is considered by many to be the eighth wonder of the ancient world. The discovery of this tomb and the excavation of it is one of the top archaeological finds of the whole world. It's as important as the pyramids, if not more important, and though there are many, many tombs in China, nothing like this scale is seen in any other part of China. Buried near the Emperor Qin's tomb to defend him in the afterlife, ancient Chinese craftsmen and engineers created over 8,000 warrior statues of stupendous quality. What is even more stunning is that these warriors are actually armed with over 10,000 fully functioning lethal bronze weapons. Warriors of the age would use copies of these exact weapons to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with their enemies. Over 2,000 years later, these weapons still have the capacity to inflict enormous damage. What is particularly stunning is that these weapons, along with the warriors and their body armor, were mass-produced in metal-forging factories in ancient China. But how did the emperor's engineers approach the complexities of high-quality mass production? And what technology was used to create some of the world's most beautiful and complex objects? Each figure is individually sculpted, cast, polished, showing the, the sort of production techniques which were not generally introduced in Europe until the 18th century. The sheer scale of the discovery is mind-blowing, and even today, some 30 years after the initial finds, archaeologists are still uncovering hundreds of ancient weapons and artifacts. One of the most unbelievable finds from the excavation so far is what has become known as the Emperor's Chariots. These full-scale chariots are believed to be the vehicles for the emperor's inspection tours in his afterlife. Investigations into their production have revealed that during the Qin Dynasty, the Chinese, through careful practice and detailed research, had established highly advanced scientific standards for metallurgy and metal production. 
The bronze chariot could indeed present the highest achievement during the bronze casting history in ancient China. These two chariots were each made of 3,000 components. Every single component was made alone and combined together later with others. In total, the emperor's chariots have 3,642 separate components of gold, silver, or bronze. What is particularly remarkable is that each was individually cast before assembly. It would have been like hand carving all the pieces of a three and a half thousand piece jigsaw puzzle separately, while never being able to match each piece to any of its neighbors until the project was complete all the while ensuring the fit was perfect. Most of the joins are created using a technique known as cast welding. Welding is a technique of joining two pieces of metal using extremely high temperatures and a welding material or solder to create a very strong bond. Cast welding of iron is very difficult even today as cast iron has a carbon content 10 times that of steel and this high carbon content causes the metal to flake. Managing the temperature of the process is the way to ensure success, and this requires a highly advanced knowledge of critical temperatures and the properties of metals. Inlaying was also used. This is a complicated process that involves inserting a piece of one metal into a slot in another, a challenging technique that the ancient Chinese mastered. These were highly advanced techniques that we still use today. I think the bronze chariots were not only an unprecedented achievement at the period, but also an achievement that could not be surpassed by any in the later dynasties and eras. Today, the chariots and horses remain the largest find of fine bronzeware discovered in the history of world archaeology. But it is not only in the production of the emperor's chariots that sophisticated technology and engineering from 2,000 years ago are to be found. Every single soldier of the Imperial Guard was armed. Archaeologists at the site have unearthed an array of weapons, including spearheads, crossbow bolts, crossbow trigger mechanisms, blades of dagger axes that would have been mounted on 10-foot poles, and 37-inch long swords that are still razor sharp. The sheer scale of the number of weapons alone suggests that vast factories and workshops were in operation on a level of industrialization to match the factories of modern Western industrial cities. With meticulous detail, each weapon was cast and modeled to its standard shape and then filed, chiseled, drilled, and polished. But there is one enduring mystery behind the discoveries of these marvelous ancient weapons. Incredibly, after 2,000 years, these bronze weapons still glitter. But how did the ancients create such metals that still preserve their strength and sharpness? Using cutting-edge electron probe microanalysis, archaeologists believe that the key to unlocking this ancient mystery may lie in the discovery of a dark gray layer covering the weapon's surface. Incredibly, the layer has been identified as chromium, a highly complex protective layer that wouldn't be developed in the West until the 1930s. This layer was found to be a kind of oxide containing chromium. This means that in the Qin era, they had already mastered the technology to use chromium. In the modern world, the technology to oxidize chromium was invented in Germany in the 1930s and in America in the 1950s, whereas in China, people knew this technology as early as 2,000 years ago and put it into practice very skillfully. It is a remarkable achievement. As research into the weapons continues, what other discoveries will be made that will cause us to reopen the history books on the development of highly complex materials? Despite the incredible advancement of the weaponry, it is the actual soldiers of the Terracotta Army themselves that still remain a mystery to modern scholars. How were they mass-produced on such an enormous scale and to such an exquisite level of craftsmanship and casting skill? It is an accomplishment that has stood the test of millennia.
The making of the terracotta warriors is a real example of how China ran a semi-industrial society. In order to build this tomb, the emperor summoned 700,000 people to work at the site, and they probably worked for 10 years, possibly longer. Modern scholars estimate that the construction of the terracotta army employed an organized labor force of nearly three quarters of a million workers who worked for 10 years or more. That is the equivalent of the labor force of 40 automobile factories. In Lintong province, close to the emperor's tomb, a replication company has undertaken the challenge to recreate the warriors using ancient materials. I think it is a very difficult thing to do, even nowadays. To make figures in the ancient time was much more complicated. Using the clay roll production method at that time, it would take 20 days for the whole process. Once the clay is rolled, the artist builds the main structure of the warrior's body. Each figure is then sculpted with armor and an individual facial expression. Modern-day workshops, repeating the production process, have found that each warrior figure requires, on average, 300 pounds of clay, meaning that the craftsmen who created the terracotta army needed in the region of well over a 1,000 tons of clay. No kilns have so far been discovered at the site, and the firing process remains an ancient enigma for archaeologists. Some scholars now believe that the molds of the warriors were encased within a temporary shell and were fired using a traditional kiln technique that reached high temperatures of up to 1,000 degrees. A project of this scale at that time would have required large kilns, but it's a great shame that none have been discovered so far. Once the temperature has climbed to its maximum, the mud's surface of the temporary shell cracks, allowing hot air to glaze and harden the figure. The results upon removing the shell are remarkable and offer a fascinating insight into the advanced understanding of ceramic and firing technology that was developed in ancient China over 2,000 years ago. What other mysteries will archaeologists uncover at this spectacular site? Ancient China was not only responsible for developing industrial machines and practices, for there was one inventor during the Song Dynasty who created a machine that is nothing short of stunning. This machine would cement China's reputation of being at the cutting edge of ancient technology. It was known as the Cosmic Engine, the ancient world's astronomical computer. Although the inventors of ancient China made huge inroads into developing a vast range of mind-boggling technologies, there is one invention that stands alone as the embodiment of the Chinese expertise in science and engineering. And as was the case with the Romans and the Greeks, it was built by a Chinese innovator and genius way ahead of his time. A master of precision technology and a brilliant all-round engineer, his name was Su Song. Su Song's most amazing invention was so complex that for centuries its workings were an enigma to engineers and inventors. It was simply called the Cosmic Engine. It was a huge water-controlled astronomical cosmic computer that is such an incredible feat of engineering and science that few Western scholars believe it could have existed. Su Song's water-driven cosmic engine was created in 1092 AD. It was considered to be one of the most splendid achievements in the history of ancient Chinese inventions. Su Song's complex mechanism was designed to calculate time, not just hours and minutes, but the weeks, months, and seasons. The ancient Chinese understood that the calendar reflects the way the Earth moves around the sun. But what makes this machine truly stand apart is that the cosmic engine also calculated the way the Earth and planets moved through space. 
Furthermore, the ancient Chinese believed that the movements of the stars were closely related to the destiny of the country and its rulers. This ancient observatory in Dengfeng County, Henan Province, is China's oldest surviving astronomical observatory. Built in the 13th century, even today when the sun reaches its zenith, rays beam down this central drain. After the rule of the Yuan Dynasty unified China, he wanted to improve the development of agriculture. They want to make a reform of the old calendar so they can know the time when the farmers plant the corn. And every day he made the shadow of the sun and made some recorder of the changes of the sun. Then according to the recorder, he made out a calendar. The calendar tells us it will take 365 days, five hours, 49 minutes, and 12 seconds for the sun to go around the Earth. But two centuries before this intriguing observatory was built, Su Song was well on his way to designing and then building his astronomical computer. This would be a machine that would not only be able to calculate the passage of the stars and the Earth to tell time, but would also reveal to the world the technological sophistication of ancient China. This was a monumental task. How might Su Song realize such an ambition? The cosmic engine is a huge 12-meter tall apparatus and very complicated inside. It includes four major systems built up by more than 400 parts. It is such a masterpiece of mechanical design and manufacturing and a marvelous achievement for the time. Today, we know exactly how this mechanism was built because Su Song left us detailed blueprints in his treatise called A New Design for a Mechanized Armillary Sphere and Celestial Globe. This book was written 900 years ago. This book is very precious to us today. It gives us the original blueprint so researchers can clearly see the configuration of this ancient apparatus. The script contains 47 illustrations, including all the parts and their assemblage. The Science and Technology Museum in Beijing, using the machine's original blueprint, has built a fully accurate reconstruction. The computer looked like a tower. The whole mechanism was five stories tall. On the front of the tower was a pagoda structure, with each of the five stories having a door through which mannequins appeared ringing bells and gongs and holding tablets to indicate the hours and other times of the day and night. But how did it work? What ingenious innovations and technological developments did this incredible device use? A celestial globe showing the movement of the stars inside the tower turned in synchronization with a sphere just above it. As the celestial globe turns, so does the sphere. This meant that the analysts and engineers using the computer could compare and cross-reference between both globes and record multiple data. All of the time indicators were controlled by the same giant machinery, which simultaneously turned the sphere and the globe. Within the mechanism is the earliest example of an escapement in a machine, a concept essential to modern mechanical clockwork. In any form of clock-based machinery, power must be delivered to the mechanism in a precise fashion which can be accurately regulated. The rationing of power is the function of this escapement and is something Su Song solved successfully. Su Song included a cogged wheel in the system. Connected to this was a stopper that only allowed the cog to rotate at a specific rate. By stopping the rotation briefly and then allowing it to continue at a precise regular frequency. It is this ingenious system that allowed the invention of Western clocks centuries later. And in fact, it is the periodic stopping and releasing of the escapement that causes the ticking sound of any clock or timer today. 
Another ingenious aspect to the cosmic engine was its power source, a great scoop wheel using water and turning all the shafts working the various devices. This ancient mega machine ran from the 11th century until it was destroyed by political enemies of the Song Dynasty. The cosmic engine is considered by some scholars to be the greatest mechanical achievement of the Middle Ages anywhere in the world. The Song Dynasty would leave a legacy to science and technology, engineering and industrialization that would change the world irreversibly. Although ancient Chinese history is littered with evidence of complex machines, many ingenious designs were inconceivable and unbelievable to the West at the time. Through the decoding of texts and archaeological investigations into ancient Chinese knowledge, we must certainly admit that many of the inventions and discoveries upon which the modern world rest come from the great minds of ancient China. Will we have to rewrite the history books? And will we have to rethink everything we thought we knew about the ancient world?